My name is Susan Ng. I'm the director for congregation-based organizing for the ELCA, the Lutheran Church, um, your hosts. And um, I am also a former organizer with the Gamaliel Foundation, um, but I've been at this position as a director for organizing for the ELCA for six and a half years. Um, and uh, also a former parish pastor, so I'm an ordained Lutheran pastor um, in moderating this session. So I was thinking about um, getting ready for this, that, that when we're doing interfaith work, which I've had the privilege of doing quite a bit of that since uh, coming to this position, there certainly are factors that characterize the differences between our faith traditions. But in organizing, we tend to want to uh, emphasize those things that we have in common, those, especially those values that we have in common that can, um, that can galvanize us in our work. And it, it does seem to me, though, that we don't always talk about this, but that one of the values, it may not have come out of our faith traditions, but it's come out of our tradition as people in, uh, brought, up in the, or brought up or brought to the U.S., is our value of democracy. And um, many of our, our church polity um, um, is, around, is, is fashioned around democracy. Now, our theology might not always be, but, uh, but at least our church polity. So it dawned on me that we really do seem to have that in common as faith traditions pretty much in this country. So, um, so the question then for us today is, how is mass incarceration a threat to our democracy? And um, that's not just about our country, but that's also about our faith values, at least in this country. Um, so uh, even if you believe that the, that the only or the main hallmark of democracy is the right to vote, which is, in my mind, the minimal <laughs> aspect of, of exercising one's democracy, um, even if you just say that that's, that's it, that's what democracy is, mass incarceration is disenfranchising citizens who are in the system of mass incarceration. But there are myriad of additional ways that people living in poverty, people of color, the incarcerated, the formerly incarcerated, are excluded or hindered from participating in the democratic process. So this session, we will, our, our, our presenters will look at the movements and campaigns that are challenging the disenfranchisement of, I think, mostly the formerly incarcerated, though they might easily go beyond that. So we welcome that. And um, uh, we're going to take this, uh, hopefully, in the order that they come. I've actually not had a chance to meet all of them, so I'm going to be saying hi at the same time that the rest of us are. Um, and I think we're almost there with, <laughs> with the uh, PowerPoint. But um, the first person... Oh, okay. Um, well, we were, yeah, we're going we're gonna to switch it up, gang. I mean, I can <laughs> so, go first, but just introduce Oh, them. I see. Um, well, I was just going to introduce people as they went. Um, it's, I think it's listed on your, your forms, but we have um, Heather Ann Thompson from Temple University, who's waiting for our system to boot up, um, and is supposed to be the opening remarks and broad analysis. We've got um, Kara Gotch from Faith in Action, um, Federal Smarter Sentencing Act, Got Reverend Eric Meter from DART, Ohio, ending school to prison pipeline. Pastor James Giles or Giles? Giles from Voice Buffalo, uh, talking with us about restorative justice. And one more on the next page. Uh, Mr. Desmond Mead, Lifelines to Healing from Pico, Florida, the Let My People Vote campaign. And so um, I'm going to time folks. They've got 10 minutes each, and we'll hope to have some time afterwards for uh, questions as well. And um, we've had a request from our videographer that if you're willing to come to this microphone, it's better for him as far as the sight lines. So um, that would be a little shift from what we were doing last time. But anyone who's willing as you speak to come to this microphone, that would be helpful. All right. We'll, uh, we're going to let Heather uh, go forward. and uh, Almost there. Almost there. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. I will hope that it will keep on here. Um, 
normally I would not have to rely on a PowerPoint, but there's some pretty cool slides, so I wanted to make sure that I was able to show those to you. Uh, so good morning. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm here, I think, to set the stage for the folks that are going to tell us what's going on uh, in cities across the country with regard to why mass incarceration matters. Uh, to our democracy. And I just want, I'm a historian by training. I teach in the Department of African American Studies and also in the Department of History at Temple University. And what I do is sort of the history of how we got into this mess and what it has to do with uh, our contemporary democracy so that we might be able to get us out of this mess. So just by way of setting the stage a little bit, I'm going to tell you some things that you already know. Uh, starting with mass incarceration matters. And it matters a lot because if you just look at this graph, uh, and if anyone is interested in any of these slides, I can certainly share them with your organizations. This gives us the sense of the scope of the problem that we're in, right? More than 7 million people in the system in some form or another. 62, more than 62 million Americans with some form of a criminal conviction. We know that we lead the, incar the, the world in incarceration. If you just look at the graph, this is a, a quick visual of some countries to give you a sense of how out of step we are. And we know that this is not just any population, but this is an overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly a population of color, both men and women. And we know that this is not because we had to incarcerate this many people. I don't have time to get into this, but the history is really interesting. We started a war on crime before we had a crime problem, in large part in response to the civil rights movement. And the reason we get such a massive crime, uh, massive incarceration problem and such a racialized incarceration problem has to do with disproportionate policing and very draconian laws. This is just marijuana policing and arrests to give you an example of how staggeringly disproportionate it has been. And we know the fallout from this. We know, right, that it has completely eroded communities and frayed families. I could talk all day about this, but you already know this from the community work that you do. This is just one graph I want to share to drive home just how devastating this has been. This is the number of children with a parent in prison or jail between 1980 and 2008 alone. And you just see this staggering, staggering uptick in the numbers of families that have been just completely pulled apart by the politics of mass incarceration. And we know on the actual neighborhood level how devastating this is. This is Brooklyn, New York. You know by looking at these red dots that incarceration is not even. You know that it's disproportionate. It hits certain com communities far harder than others, notwithstanding what laws are being broken. And we call these million dollar blocks because if you break it down to an actual block by block level, this is some dollar figures put to that map to give you a sense of what it in fact costs to have this devastating policy in our communities. We also know that it matters because it completely undermines our economy. We heard a little bit about that this morning. We heard about unemployment. We've also known for years that the unemployment disparity between blacks and whites in this country is already catastrophic. But if you look at this with regard to time, over, to over time, and map that on the incarceration rate, you see something pretty interesting, which is when we had our greatest spikes of incarceration, we also get spikes in unemployment. And that's because, of course, the box, and because we know that people are severely discriminated against once they get out. We also know that there's unemployment because we have shifted an enormous amount of labor into prisons, where neither the people in the prisons are making the money, nor the people on the outside who were doing the work before. Only some people are making the money, and I'm not pointing any fingers here. <laughs> so the real question is, why are we still here if we all know how devastating this is? And if this affects 62 million people in some form or fashion, if this affects so many, then why is it that it continues? Why have we not been able to stop it in its tracks from a policy perspective? Well, we're trying. I think we're getting there. I think real change is happening, and we're going to certainly hear about how that's happening. But one thing to bear in mind is that there's some very important structural reasons why it's been so hard to overturn this. And that's because mass incarceration has built into it structural things that have literally distorted our democracy and made it almost impossible, not impossible, but almost impossible for the people most affected by this devastating system to actually change it. One of these you know, it's felon disfranchisement, right? But what you may not know is that we did this once before, right after the Civil War. 
We had a whole nother civil rights rebellion, right? The Civil War. And what did we do? We criminalized spaces in new ways. We locked people up. We put them to work. And we took away their right to vote. The same thing happens after our second carceral crisis, which was after the civil rights 60s. This is challenged all the way up at the Supreme Court level in a very important decision, Richardson versus Ramirez, which said in a very tortured reading of our Constitution that it was perfectly okay to disfranchise people with a criminal record. And lo and behold, by 2006, 48 out of 50 states had some form of disfranchisement on the books. Now, did that change our democracy? You betcha. Political science have, scientists have looked at this on the micro and macro level and have argued that this has changed elections, every election in some form or fashion, from at least 1970 to 2002. We can talk about that. The problem is it's not just felon disfranchisement. It's also something that has to do, and by the way, on this map for disfranchisement, this is 2000. The situation is far worse now. I just don't have a recent map. How many people how many people of African descent, how many African Americans are disfranchised? And how much mass incarceration has distorted our democracy? But it isn't just that, and this is where I'm gonna wrap up. It also has to do with our census. Because the US Census has always counted people not where they actually lived before they were incarcerated, but where they are incarcerated. And this has been the most devastating distortion of our democracy that we are only just now beginning to talk about. What does this mean? It means for the state that I live in, which is Pennsylvania, that eight, count them, eight House districts meet minimum federal population requirements only because they count prisoners as their local residents. But by the way, prisoners can't vote. And their political power has just been shifted from the cities from whence they came. But census population doesn't just mean political power, it also means resources, funding for early childhood nutrition programs, and so forth. So if this also has a 19th century shade back to the past, it should alarm you, because have you ever heard of the three-fifths clause, right? Where black bodies count for white political power, we are, in essence, doing this again in virtually every state of our union, except for right now, Maryland has gotten rid of it, and New York, and kudos to them. But let's be clear, this is Illinois, where we all sit today. 90% of Illinois' prisoners are incarcerated downstate, where their bodies are used to pad 11 house districts. Cook County, which contains Chicago, actually is the home, the real home, of about 60% of those people who were incarcerated. But notably, every prison that was built after 1941 was built pretty far away from Chicago, okay? So you can see what's happening here. In essence, if you look at this graphic, this is Illinois. And those arrows represent political power shifting to districts that, guess what, vote for prison expansion, vote for drug laws, vote for mandatory minimums, and vote for tough on crime policy. So I hope I'm beginning to show a little bit about why it is we have the policies that we have. I don't have time, but I've got maps on Ohio, because we have someone from Ohio here on the panel. Again, skewing of our democracy. Florida, skewing of our democracy, as another panelist will, will um, talk about. So what are we really talking about here? We're talking about that mass incarceration matters because it has not only frayed our communities and distorted our economy, but it has distorted our very democracy. And I say this to a group of amazing people from the faith community to say that as we move forward, we need to be really clear that so many of our people are not in prison because of heinous crimes. This is not a question of redemption always. This is a question of policy. This is a question of repressive policy. And if we can understand the way these policies work, and we can understand why it is that they stay from you know, cycle to cycle to cycle, then we understand just how much work we have to do and how, much, how important community work is. Good news, we've gotten rid of prison gerrymandering again in two states. We're working in states across the country to do it again. Community work matters, all of this. It doesn't mean it's impossible to change it, but now hopefully I hope set the stage for why it has felt like such an uphill battle and exactly what it is we might have to do. And the first thing might be ending prison gerrymandering. Thank you. And now I want to uh, welcome uh, uh, Kara.
that. Good morning, everybody. Hello. Hello. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I work uh, at, with the General Board of Church and Society of the United Methodist Church, and I coordinate a working group called the Faith in Action Criminal Justice Reform Working Group. I'm actually new, brand new, to working with the faith community. Only about three months prior to that, I've worked for various criminal justice reform um, advocacy organizations doing this kind of work at the national level for about 15 or 16 years. So it's a real pleasure to be working with this community, meeting a lot of new people who are doing wonderful work around the country, and really trying to lift up, at least at the national level, a voice that I feel is not heard enough from, from policymakers. Um, and that's the, 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 the faith voice. So thank you for having me and for letting me come into your home. Tara, excuse me, are you willing to come to this, or where, would you rather stay where you are? Uh, the, mic, the, the videographer would prefer you here if you're okay. failing. That's fine. All right, thank you. I've paused your time. <laughs> 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 Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. So Heather's uh, presentation was great because one of the main points I wanted to make, she or has already made for me, which is policy really does matter. And that's why we are facing mass incarceration today um, because of policies passed over the last 30, 35 years, which has increased sentencing, um, criminalized more behaviors and made punishments longer, t terms of time and served in prison and in jails longer. And it's not because of crime. It's not because we are the most evil people in the, in the world that we have mass incarceration. It's not because our crime rate is continually going up and up and up. In fact, crime is at historic lows. So why do we have mass incarceration? It's because of uh, punitive policies that have been passed. So at the federal level, I've been working for a number of years uh, on several issues, but what I'm going to talk about today is sentencing. Um, in the 1980s, in 1986 and, and 1988, Congress passed the Anti-Drug Abuse Acts, uh, Anti -drug Abuse Acts, which created mandatory minimums for all drugs. This was pretty new for most of the country that the federal government had created these very harsh mandatory minimums. What's probably most known by people is the 100 to 1 crack cocaine disparity that was created by Congress back then. Uh, it was signed, the legislation was signed by President Reagan, but we can't really pin it on the Republicans. Uh, this was a very bipartisan initiative to get tough on crime. There was fear about crack cocaine. That it was a new drug on the scene. There was turf wars happening in inner community, inner cities, and uh, there was a lot of violence associated with the drug trade. But there was also a misperception that crack was more addictive than any other kind of drug. That it was creating a new generation of addicted children uh, whose mothers had been using the drug, which is all in the years since been proven false. But nonetheless, because of the hysteria at the time, Congress reacted very quickly without he much hearing or much information, but because of hysteria and created some of the most punitive sentencing policies in the country. Now, 30 years later, we're still stuck with this problem um, in these policies, and the federal prison system is now the largest prison system in the country. Half of the people who are incarcerated at the federal level are there because of drugs. Most of those people are nonviolent, and they're very low-level offenses. There's about 216,000 people who are incarcerated at the federal level. Um, and so I've been working for about 10 years trying to change that. Um, one of the, probably it's good to mention that in 2010, I was, had the privilege of working on passage of the Fair Sentencing Act. Um, which was a law that addressed the 100 to 1 crack cocaine disparity. Now, what the compromise legislation came out was not what our, the advocates wanted. It's not what we had hoped for. But what it did was significantly reduce the disparity between the treatment of crack and powder. So there's no longer a 100 to 1 disparity. You no longer can get a mandatory minimum of five years for simple possession of five grams, which is equivalent to about two sugar packets, of crack cocaine. Uh, the simple possession mandatory minimum was eliminated, and now you have to have at least an ounce to get a five-year mandatory minimum. So progress, right? <laughs> um, so, but 
in perspective, keeping that in perspective, um, you know, people, the five, five grams of crack cocaine, you had to have 500 grams of powder cocaine. So that's where the disparity comes from. Two drugs that are chemically identical, very different sentencing structure. And we know part of the reason why that is is because of the perception that the people who use crack cocaine, which is also false, were predominantly African American, and the people who use powder cocaine were pre predominantly Caucasian. Those, that is not in fact true, but that was the perception. And that's where a lot of the outrage around our drug sentencing laws in this country come from, from this very uh, racial disparate impa uh, impact. About 80% of the people in federal prison for crack cocaine offenses are African American. And so the burden of that very um, harsh and excessive penalty has been bared on them. So, uh, so what we have, so, in 2010, President Obama signed the Fair Sentencing Act. This was after about 25 years of advocacy. Now, this is how slow uh, Congress works and how policy, how slow policy change is, particularly in this field, because it is bipartisan. It was a bipartisan group of legislators who created these laws, and it's a bipartisan group of legislators we need to rely on to, to change them, to, to, to get rid of these mandatory minimums. So. Um, 2010, 25 years after advocacy, we had a uh, dis reduction in the disparity, modest, I'll admit, um, but it has had a tremendous impact because um, changes in, in implementing the law, the U.S. Sentencing Commission, which sets the sentencing guidelines at the federal level, decided to make those changes retroactive. So there were a number of people, about 16,000 people, who had time taken off their sentence and were, in fact, released early. We've seen the first dip in um, the federal prison population. You know, for 30-odd years, the prison population has gone up and up in um, every year, and over the last year, we've actually seen a slight decline. Um, I should mention at the state level, that nationally, the de there's a decline in the, th in, the federal, in the state prison population, which is also something we should all be proud of. Um, you know, we've only seen increases over the last 35, 40 years, and in the last three years, there's actually been a slight decline. So I think it's important to take time to to point to the successes. And part of it is, is because of bipartisan agreement at the state level among both conservatives and liberals about what we've done. Mass incarceration is not working. It's expensive. And we're not, in fact, helping anyone. And so there has been some reevaluation of sentencing policies. And now we're starting to see a decline. Now, they're very short. They're very small. But I'm hoping that this is the beginning of a trend. So. Fast forward four years, I actually took a break from my criminal justice advocacy work for about a year and a half and started back up last year. And come to find out, we have advanced the thinking in Congress, which is hard to believe, has advanced quite a bit around criminal justice reform. Uh, the Fair Sentencing Act, like I said, was a, a hard fight, and it took a long, line, long time to pass, and there was a lot of compromise required. But I come back into the field, and now we have something called the Smarter Sentencing Act, which is even more bipartisan. We have the primary sponsors are Mike Lee and Senator Dick Durbin. Um, we also have Ted Cruz on the bill, Rand Paul. Um, lots of Tea Partiers believe in um, sentencing reform, if you can believe that. Um, and so it's a piece of legislation that would take the mandatory minimums for all drugs and cut them in half. Uh, the five-year mandatory minimum for all drugs would be cut to two. The mandatory ten-year mandatory minimum would be cut to five, and the the twenty-year mandatory minimum would be cut to ten. Now, from my perspective, as someone who's been doing policy at the federal level on criminal justice reform, this is radical. Knowing how Congress is, this is incredibly radical. Um, but we had a hearing at the end of January in the Senate Judiciary Committee. It passed out of committee at th with a 13 to 5 vote. Uh, we're hoping for the bill to come to the floor in the next month or so. And we really could use everyone's support and the support of all of your denominations and congregations to really try and get this passed, because it really would have a profound impact. Not only would it cut the, uh, the sentencing for all drugs, but it would also make the Fair Sentencing Act, the crack cocaine uh, reform bill that passed in 2010, retroactive. So about 8,800 current federal prisoners would be eligible for a sentence reduction a significant sentence reduction. 
And it would also make some other sentencing, expand um, some other sentencing provisions that would allow judges to depart in cer certain circumstances from mandatory minimums. So it's, so it's a really exciting time, and I really encourage folks who um, are interested in um, criminal justice reform and sentencing reform to, to talk to me and to, to learn about uh, the incredible opportunities there are to really make a difference. Thanks. All right, uh, welcome Reverend Eric Meter from DART, Ohio, to talk with us. Amen. I have to uh, start um, with a nod of the people who talked about jobs earlier. Um, my name is Eric Meter. I'm the associate minister um, at the First Universal Unitarian Universalist Church in Columbus, Ohio. My sweetie, Anne, my partner, it graduated with her Bachelor's of Science last December. She is 52 years old. She is a black Jamaican and Chinese descent, and she's looking for work. <laughs> she texted me this earlier. Jim Trestle is the new president at Youngstown. You have to be famous and be part of something inappropriate, and you get ahead. Really? What the blank does he know about running a university? No fair, I want a job, I'm special too. <laughs> Had to share that. Had to share that. <laughs> and you know what? She is special too. She's been working since she was 16. Any place would be better off to have her with her. Um, I serve a church in Ohio now. But previous to that, I served a congregation in suburban Northern California. And in many ways, um, I'm here because of a prisoner I used to visit by the name of Jesse, who was in prison for murder at New Folsom. Jesse was not a model prisoner because he felt in his bones there was nothing worth going back home to. His brother died. His family didn't get the news to him for six months. He was in solitary when I visited him last. Um, and so while I was called to Columbus to do primarily pastoral work, I'm doing political work too, because it needs to be done. Um, and the story I have for you today is policy, but it's policy on a very local level. I think I heard the phrase school to prison pipeline at least a half a dozen times last night. Um, the project that I've been working with, Keeping Kids in School, is part of our CBCO in Columbus, Ohio, the BREAD Network, Building Responsibility, Equality, and Dignity. Um, BREAD is an affiliate of the DART organization. I want to start paraphrasing the sociologist Robert Bella, who wrote, democracy begins with paying attention. Begins with paying attention. Well, we pay attention to our children's welfare. It's when we think we can't do anything about improving it that the problems begin. Each summer, our CBCO, CBCO and I imagine others as well, maybe the time of year may change a little bit, um, involve themselves in listening sessions, setting up listening sessions for members of our congregations. And in Bread, we have over 50 representing Jews, Christians, Catholics, Muslims, and Unitarian Universalists like myself, um, come together to share with one another the issues in our communities that keep us up at night. What's keeping us tossing and, stern and turning instead of getting good night's sleep? And in 2005 and again in 2009, the issue that rose up out of those situa such situations, conversations, was concern for our kids who were far too often on the streets when they should have been in school. I joined this team four and a half years ago, and at that time we realized that while the school system has a stated policy, page one of their, maybe not page one, page two maybe, of their website, that the school will not give out of school suspensions for either truancy or disruptive behavior, which is a general description, but it doesn't include anything heavy like drugs or violence. It's just being a nuisance, really. 
that the school's policy was that there will be no out-of-school suspensions for these infractions, that for over 4,200 times, and we're talking of a school population of somewhere between 50, 51, maybe as much as 52,000 students, 4,200 school students had been suspended out of school for truancy. That's not a punishment, that's a reward, if you remember your school. <laughs> and over 15,000 out-of-school suspensions were given and have consistently been given since then for disruptive behavior. And so while it's as ugly a phrase as I know, we have a school-to-prison pipeline in Columbus, Ohio, the state's largest city. So we have been putting attention on this and for the last four years have been meeting with school administrators quarterly. And that number of 4,200 has gone down in the last, in the, the six months, uh, the first half of this school year, there were just under 500, um, which is still really bad because most of those out of school suspensions are given as the school year gets further. So I'm anticipating about 1,500 this year, maybe a little less than that. And that 15,000 figure has remained constant. Uh, just last week, a week ago Tuesday, we met with the new, stoop, new school superintendent. Um, normally we would meet with three members of the staff. He brought 10. And they, try, they brought in a principal from an elementary school to snow the rest of us on how good this um, new program that they have working. Well, it works really good in elementary schools. In middle schools and high school, it's much more difficult. We know that. So what are you doing there? I need to say that Red is not doing this alone. And the school system is not the only funder, or not the main, not the only main stakeholder in this. We've been able to bring in child services, the, the county jobs department, the county prosecutor's office, and if there's an unsung hero in this, it's Franklin County Prosecutor Ron O'Brien, who sends out over 2,000 letters a year to parents of children who are at risk of significant truancy issues. We have been able to divert and this is the important number, in a project, an anti-truancy program called Project Key, which operates, had been in three schools, now it's in seven, between 90 and 94 percent of the youth who go through that program. Last year, it was just under 93 percent. Why the schools and other agencies aren't able to put this in all the schools is beyond me. I mean, it's money, but is working and it saves money in the long run. We've also had partnership in the police department. They've run, once again, truancy sweeps, which sounds awful, but they're getting those kids to centers at the YMCA and back in school. Street crime in Columbus has decreased. Now, in the last year and a half, we haven't had those centers at the Y. I expect those numbers to go back up again. I don't know if it would have made um, your news outlets, but in Columbus, Columbus has been a one of several cities in Ohio with um, how you say the school system has been cooking the books on enrollment and attendance. Um, we fired four of our school principals this last spring, late winter. Um, two of those are, school, are suing the school district saying, we were doing what we were told. You're making scapegoats out of us, which I trust to be thoroughly accurate. Four will go down, the rest will remain. So we've made some progress in Columbus by bringing people together from our congregations and lifting a light on this issue. It is far from done. I remember John in this room, who is our organizer for bread at the time, he's moved on to Dart Central, um, sitting down with me a little over a year ago and saying, do we declare partial victory or do we continue? And the answer is the job's not done. The pipeline still is in existence. 
We're not giving up. We're not giving up. Thank you. And Pastor James Giles from Voice Buffalo around restorative justice. Welcome. I am certainly delighted to be here. It's always good to know that someone is in the trenches with you in this battle. And it's, uh, I'm, getting, I'm starting to see a global concentration and focus on changing the status quo in America. Uh, that's essential. And I think um, uh, before I get into that, uh, allow me, I would like to recognize I'm here from the Gamalia Western New York Foundation. Uh, in society, uh, my Gamaliel partners back there, and uh, uh, welcome you. Uh, I attribute much of my training to some things that I learned from them. I am uh, the vice president of Voice Buffalo, which is a Gamaliel affiliate out of Buffalo, New York, and we're concerned with issues in Western New York. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm also the president of Back to Basics Outreach Ministry. I've been involved in court advocacy for the last 20 years, uh, prison reentry for the last 20 years, uh, gang and anti-violence uh, uh, strategies for the last 15 years, and uh, youth intervention programs for the last 20 years. Uh, in, in all of that, we've come to, uh, to learn a, a few things about the system that we are working against. Uh, I, I want to read something before I begin into this restorative justice that kind of sets the tone for what it is that we're up against. And it simply reads that when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which laws of nature and nature's God entitle them to dissent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, which begins the plight of our democracy in this country. So first of all, the framers of, of that particular document, Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin, uh, Roger Sherman, uh, Robert, Ro Robert R. Livingston, at the time when they said all men created equal, they were sending a message to King George of Great Britain. And what they really want, was saying that all white Anglo-Saxon Americans are created equal and that they are endowed with certain unalienable rights and among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the trend still exists today. And that's what it's about and that's what we're up against and that's why we will not leave this idea of notion that Racial equality does not exist here in America and has created these systems that have perpetuated poverty for a targeted group, uh, poor education, mass incarceration for a targeted group, as the uh, Heather had uh, just so adequately illustrated. So we, we have a challenge here, but it's not just to address these issues, because if we don't get to the core of what's creating this, then as Michelle Alexander said in her book, The New Jim Crow, say, we may have some victories, but if we don't change public consensus, there would just be small, minor victories, but the status quo will remain the same and always create or double the problem. So what we are doing in the areas of restorative justice, and we recognize even restorative justice limitations, that we, have, we decided that in the city of Buffalo, we have some statistics of our own. And this is the thing that began to marshal in the movement toward establishing restorative justice or, and so that we can create restorative practices 
in our public schools and toward our criminal justice system and within our community. And these statistics were created by the, uh, a student from the University of Buffalo researched this for us, that in Erie County, we have 14% African-American population. But yet we represent 43% of the arrests and 67% of the convictions. Now something is wrong with that picture. And we made an appeal to the faith community that say, hey, can you see something is wrong with this? And so when we visit churches, almost 10 to 20% of the population or the congregation can raise their hand that they have a loved one or themselves have been incarcerated in Erie County. So we decided that we would develop a system where recognizing the challenges, if we could develop what we call restorative hubs where the community could come together in churches, in the faith community, and begin to exercise what is called restorative practices, whether it be peace circles or whether it be peace conferences, when a harm has been done to another person and we have a system that has harmed us that needs a peace circle. It has been traditionally, it was the way that we did things traditionally. Uh, whether you were a Berber tribe, whether you were the uh, Dinka tribe in, in Africa, uh, or the Maasai in Africa, when something happened within the community, the community came together to solve its problems. It's this document that says we shall establish a government has taken away community competence, where now the community is so desensitized to what's going on around them that we don't even see or feel the impact when a misjustice is done. So we decided to wake up the churches, to wake up the faith community, and begin to develop these restorative hubs by training facilitators within the churches to be responsible for developing community competence within the areas that they occupy their services. And how we did that was first of all train them and then establish relationship. Gamelio taught me this. I've been in this game for a long time because I came out of prison. Since the prison for, did two bids for something I had absolutely nothing to do, but that was okay because I did so much that I got away with. Yeah, I, could, I, I got it. I, I got it, you know, they, so they caught up with me some other way, all right? So it was okay, but but I could see firsthand the injustices that take place in mass incarceration. I'm just one of the numbers. A Caucasian lady identified me as the perpetrator of cashing a check in, at her teller's office, right? And listen, I always smile. Back then, and we're talking about 25 years ago, I had a cracked tooth right here. <laughs> Anybody could see it. The person that actually did it had perfect teeth. <laughs> but she said, Yes, it was him, and I got sentenced to three and a half years for that, okay? But I could work with it because I was doing some, some mad stuff back then. So now, which helps me to relate to what's going on in my, in my community. So the restorative justice is one, on the one hand, we're trying to restore, how much time I got? A minute and a half. A minute and a half, very quickly. The Voice Buffalo galvanized around us to kind of get restorative justice into this violence that we have in the community of Buffalo. We, we had, listen, 14, 15 year old, that's not, this is not something that's natural. I had a 14 year old Christian Porter's killed in the middle of the night on a busy street. I have a 15 year old killed because he said the wrong thing to somebody. Right? And nobody's doing anything. If this kind of shooting was taking place in suburban America, the National Guard would come in here and take away everybody's weapon. Right. They would not stand by and allow this. So we've woken up churches to begin to say, let's help build community confidence. Let's help the community, once again, be responsible for the things that are going on in the community. And to do that, we have to develop relationships. The Gamelia Foundation taught me about re developing relationships, organizing power, organizing people and organizing uh, money 
and organizing and developing leaders to do this. And that many, work, many of you are already doing that. But if we don't begin to get to the core issues, we got systems in place perpetrated by the good old boys, right, that's not going to change. I don't care how much work that we do, how many victories, small victories, we, they'll allow us to have that. They'll allow the uh, water company, they'll allow us to hire a few people. But they're going to keep the system that disenfranchise people in place. They're going to keep that until we get to the core of what's really going on, and that's racism. Yep. Amen. Thank you. And finally, Mr. Desmond Mead from Lifelines to Healing of Pico, Florida. I don't know about you all, but I was expecting the offering basket to be passed after. <laughs> In August of 2005, on a hot and humid day in Miami, I stood in front of railroad tracks. And for a few moments, I was able to block out the oppressive heat and humidity. Because at that time, the only thing that was going through my mind was how much pain I was going to feel when I jumped in front of an oncoming train. That day, as I stood in front of the tracks, I was homeless, unemployed, recently released from prison. I was raised in a Christian family, and I knew that my mother did not raise me with the intentions of me being there that day. But there I was, and I saw no hope. And I stood there waiting on the train. Fortunately, that train never came, and I crossed those tracks. And I checked myself into a substance abuse treatment facility. And after completing that, I went to a homeless shelter. And while living at the homeless shelter, I enrolled in one of the local community colleges there. And today, I'm, as I stand in front of you, I am two weeks away from graduating from law school. Good morning. My name is Desmond Mead, and I currently serve as a state director to the Lifelines of Healing campaign in Florida. The Lifelines of Healing campaign is part of the PICO network whose guiding principles are wrapped around the concept of proclamation, policy, and programs. The Lifeline the Healing Campaign focuses primarily on reducing gun violence and also on mass incarceration. And we relies within there is felon disfranchisement. And so in Florida, we have chose, we chose to focus on felon disfranchisement because of what is going on in that state. Currently, Florida has the largest amount of individuals, returning citizens, who are disfranchised. In 2010, that number was tabulated to be over 1.54 million. We believe that today that number is nearing more 2 million. That, for, to put it in context, that number is more than the entire population of over 15 states and U.S. territories or over 80 countries. And we account for a quarter of the people who are disfranchised in the United States. Florida's policy now is that once an individual is convicted of a felony, they lose their civil rights for life. We're only one of three states now that permanently disfranchises an individual. It does provide a mechanism, and I'm gonna put it in context. So if I was an individual that completed my sentence today, according to Florida's policies, I would have to wait until May of 2021 before I am allowed to even apply to have my rights restored. Once I apply in May of 2021, there's an additional six-year application processing time. So I would actually have to wait until May of 2027 at least just to see if I have a chance and even when I get there arrest-free, the chances of me getting my rights restored are less than 0.008%. Now, we're very clear on something. And, and when we're talking about race and when we're talking about uh, mass incarceration, when we talk about felon disfranchisement, we understand that there is no debate that these policies 
disproportionately impacts African American community more than any other community. But we also understand that we do not have a total lock on the misery. We do not have a total lock on discrimination. We understand that, and Florida serves as a perfect backdrop to that because of the issues that they're going through, uh, not only with felon disfranchisement, but you all remember a, a young man by the name of Trayvon Martin or a young lady by the name of uh, Marissa Alexander or a gentleman by the name of George Zimmerman. And so we know and that there are so many issues that are going on in Florida, but we know that it, it comes to the root of two, two things, really. Number one is that how do we value the lives of someone else? How do we value the lives of the immigrant? How do we value the lives of the returning citizen, the minimum wage worker, and so on and so on? And we also know that, that private prisons are a driving force behind some of these policies that not only incarcerate African Americans at a disproportionate rate, but also imprison immigrants and declare them illegal and dehumanize them and incarcerate them. Let us be clear, in the state of Florida in 2010, Florida allocated $20,000 to incarcerate one person per year. And to take it a step further, the prisons make $48,000 per year to incarcerate an immigrant. And so we knew going into Florida, when we were talking about felon disfranchisement, it, we knew that the felon disfranchisement was but a symptom of a much deeper issue. But the beautiful thing, and I tell people this, and they look at me like I'm crazy, I love Florida and I love the situation it is in right now because it creates an opportunity for us to bring together black and brown and white, for us to, to, us to bring together the poor and to actually see and eliminate these systems that have oppressed people for so long. And so with our Lifeline to Healing campaign, we are set about to change these felon, uh, these felon disfranchisement policies. And we know that, matter of fact, my mother used to tell me when I was growing up that the tail does not wag the dog. The dog wags the tail. And recognizing that we're in a system where we give so much deference to our elected officials, we lose sight of the fact that this country was created by who? We the people. And we elect those individuals. And so we knew that there was power in the vote. And so we understood that the system was designed not only to oppress, but the best way to oppress was to keep people from being civically engaged, to keep people from having their voices heard in the, at the voting locations. And so we set about to change that dynamic and empower those individuals who are mostly directly impacted, people like me. For instance, no matter, you know, you, you just gave me a round of applause, but in spite of the fact that I was able to overcome all of these things, I still cannot vote. I still cannot buy a home for my family. I still cannot even sit for the bar so I can practice in my profession. And so we empower people like me to not just be benef uh, uh, be beneficiaries of the work, but be creators and leaders of the work, to be out in the forefront and so even though that these individuals cannot vote, they have family members who can vote. And so we empower them to be organizers, to organize their family members, to organize their communities. But we don't just stop there because as the great reverend just alluded to, we know that we even have clergy who are directly impacted. Men of God who might have made mistakes in the past, but have ever, since then turned their life around and become pillars in our community. And so we also organize congregations to stand on the faith principles of redemption, restoration, and forgiveness. We know that when Christ was on the cross and the criminal asked him to be saved, Jesus did not tell him he had to wait five or seven years. Jesus said, this day you shall enter into heaven. And so we are organizing churches along with returning citizens and their families to stand up on those faith principles, creating that space, but in the process of doing that, knowing that we're not 
we're more about the movement than the moment. We know that we have to address the systematic racism that is pervasive in our community. And so we engage not only our congregations, but also our returning citizens into some deep thought provoking dialogue about race, about what does it mean about the privileges and things of that nature. And then we push them even further because we refuse to allow ourselves to be comfortable because when we are, are comfortable, we don't grow. And so we push ourselves to be uncomfortable and act upon this dialogue and engage in actions where there's truly black brown unity. And in doing so, we create a movement that not only changes the system, but allows or change the policy, I should say, but allow us to change the system forever. And so I just wanted to just share this with you because it was amazing that you put it. Our main campaign that we have in Florida is our Let My People Vote campaign. Just like Moses told Pharaoh to let his people go, that we're asking all congregations to tell their elected officials to let our people vote. 